Hope everyone's doing well. Welcome to the Magia Mindset. Today's guest is going to break down the recruiting process, player identification, and as a player, how to properly see which program is the best fit. It is my absolute pleasure to welcome our guest on the show again, UC Davis women's soccer head coach, Tracy Ham. Roll the intro. Tracy, thank you so much again for uh, making time to come on the episode. Uh, it was fantastic having you on in 2020. I know uh, it was a unique year nonetheless. And uh, I know as in your role, your hands were definitely full and they're still full going into <laughs> a full swing of 2021. So again, I appreciate you coming on air to get more into a detailed topic that we're going to kind of get into. Absolutely. Thanks for having me again. <laughs> My pleasure. So one of the things we wanted to kind of revolve this episode around is the recruiting process for parents, how to map it out properly, players, how to map it out properly, academically, athletically, um, in getting identified into a, getting into a Division I program on the women's side. And even specifically speaking of UC Davis, what I wanted to get the ball rolling with is talking about it, the recruiting process. What age does it start in? Uh, what are the primary focuses year to year that it's supposed to be specific on into properly getting the attention? When can they start dialogue with you guys mm -hmm. in communication? When can they send an email? And if they're not getting an email back, it doesn't mean you can't, uh, you don't <laughs> like them. It's just that's the, there's timetables of that. So they can be more educated into mapping it out the right way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the recruiting process starts, I'd say, your freshman year. Um, there's some eighth graders that get looked at, but those are typically like youth national team players. Um, and they, you know, they go on a wall somewhere in writing, um, you know, for some programs, uh, top, you know, typically I'd say like the top 10, you know, universities. So like your, your Stanford, your North Carolina, those are the, the programs that would be identifying eighth graders at that point. Um, but freshman year, it really does start for you. And, um, at that point, you really just want to cast a wide net and think about, you know, what's the most important thing. So is it location? Is it size of school, private versus public? Um, and then what division, division one, division two, division three, NAIA, um, what are your priorities? If it's soccer, like 100% soccer, then, um, you know, that might change what you're looking at. Um, so after your freshman year, um, your freshman and your sophomore year are really good times to go visit schools um, and go to ID camps because that's the only way that you can actually have communication with a college coach. Um, it can only be about camps. Um, and it's a great way to get identified early. So typically, we would have a freshman or a sophomore come to camp. Um, we'd look at them, evaluate them. Oh, they look great. Now they're on my list that I'm going to go watch them play with their club team um, in an event. So that's kind of the the best way to go about it is use your freshman and your sophomore years um, attending ID camps and kind of building a relationship with coaches that way because um, we can't have any communication with you really um, until after June 15th going into your junior year. Uh, so if you write emails, uh, you know, your freshman, sophomore year, hey coach, I'm really interested. Um, come watch my game. You're not going to get a response, anything like that. If you write about camp, hey, I'm interested in coming to your camp, we can respond with camp information. And it's pretty generic. We can't write anything personal um, about you as a player or a person. It's just mainly a, a camp invitation. Um, once you are on campus, um, at that point, we can give you feedback um, and do like a little bit of an eval, but we can't talk about the recruiting process or really anything specific about you know, our school. Um, it has to be very, really surface layer soccer specific um, information and feedback. So after your June 15th, going into your junior year, that's when there's tons of freedom. So that's when you can call coaches on the phone. They can call you, you can text, you can email, and that's when you should be thinking, um, you know, can I get a response? 
And the typical timeline, I would say for a division one player, you're probably looking to commit uh, in the fall of your junior year or the spring of your junior year is typically um, a pretty standard time frame, And that's changed a little bit with COVID. I think that there's been a little bit of um, some panic uh, and trying to find a home really quickly. Um, but I would say, you know, your junior fall is a great time and your junior spring. And there's nothing wrong with committing your senior year, but I know that, co- you know, players like to know where they're going, going into their senior season. No, that's fantastic. And the main thing is we both know if they're going to be in your top five of your recruiting class, top two, it's someone you pursued more than they pursued you. And to get your attention in that, I know the dynamic on the men's side is changing and on the female side too. What is the top leagues? What is the top uh, competitions? Because when you get a high level competition and you're evaluating that uh, video, that 90 minute clip, you can tell if they can play at a high level Mm -hmm. because the competition's high. Yes. For players that are, let's say, in that ballpark, they're athletic. They're technical. They're there. Potentially, they're there. But they're not aware of what is the highest competition offered. What is something like um, the UC Davis women's soccer um, coaching staff goes to to observe, to see um, that crop of players that they want for their class in the top five echelon of their recruiting class? What is that to kind of break down? Well, I I would say that there's a, there's a lot of events. And I think that, you know, most coaches aren't super strict in what events or what level they go to. Um, I think that there's a lot of players that are really talented that don't necessarily have the option, maybe like geographically or financially to participate in like the ECNL or in the GA, uh, just because of the travel, Um, you know, and just the requirements and registration fees to play in that club. So I I don't think that there's a lot of coaches that automatically write off, you know, attending an NPL event or, um, you know, looking at different leagues. But, um, you know, I think the GA, which again, hasn't really had that many events, it's fairly new, but, you know, ECNL is, is typically you, we kind of know what to expect going in. That's going to be a really, really high level, um, you know, really competitive and for the most part, really well coached players. Like they play for good clubs, good coaches. So there's kind of an expectation uh, that, you know, you know what you're going to get when you show up. Um, Now with that being said, because there's so many, you know, division one schools, we all can't get the top two or three players on each team. Right. So we have to cast just as wide of a net as, you know, the players do. So, um, that that's kind of why I say that there isn't necessarily one level that we know is going to be phenomenal, that we're only going to look at these players that play for this club that play at this level, because we know that, you know, I would rather have the top player off of an NPL team than maybe the 10th ranked player on an ECNL team, if that makes sense. So, you know, we want to cast a wide net. We want to make sure that we don't overlook somebody just based on the league that they play. Um, you know, but we do when, if we do have to continue recruiting over video, it is difficult for us to watch um, and identify a player, but do they look really good because their competition isn't great? Um, and that's, what's kind of nice knowing like the ECNL or the GA levels that, you know, both teams are actually high quality as opposed to there's some other events where, you know, one team might be really, really great team and another team just doesn't have quite the level of talent. So one team looks phenomenal, you know, and you're like, are they actually that good as players or is it just because the team they're playing isn't great? And so that's what makes it tough with the videos. Um, But I would say that there isn't necessarily one event or one league that's better than another. Um, If you're doing your due diligence as a college coach, you're going to go to as many events and watch as many levels as possible. And we're all, everyone's always looking for that diamond in the rough, you know, that gets overlooked or doesn't get an opportunity to, you know, go to big events and and be seen. No, that's great. It kind of helps transition to our next part when you're discussing diamond in the rough is what is, um, how do you identify your type of player? What are the qualities you look for when you want to bring Uh, a player into your program because yeah on the outside surface if they look the part athletically technically that's one part but bringing them behind in the uh, locker room they are they the team players are they uh hard working are they determined are they focused i know everybody has certain things they overlook 
and certain things that's a must. What are the key qualities you look in your overall player that fits your program? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question because we spend, once you're, you know, a college soccer player, we spend three hours a day, almost every day together for four years. So we have to really like each other because we're going to be on long bus rides and fly together. And, you know, we have to trust that you're doing the right things and that you're committed, um, you know, because ultimately as a college coach, like our jobs depend on 18 year olds making good decisions. Right. So there's a lot more goes into it than just being a good soccer player. Um, but ultimately, you know, when we're trying to identify what do we want in our program, um, I, I think that, you know, there's players that are very technical, right. And they've got great vision. Um, they've got a really good tactical awareness. They're coachable. They work hard. They do extra, um, you know, and those are fantastic players. Um, but we want to see a player that's got all of that skill set and is also able to execute it stronger and faster and quicker than another player. Um, because ultimately, the way that I look at it is athletes win athletic contests. Soccer is an athletic contest. Women's soccer is an athletic contest. And when you continue to you know, look at the different levels, um, like the professional players, our women's national team, those women are the, a full player, right? They've got all the tactical awareness that you would need. They're, you know, they're super technical. They, they've got good vision and, you know, they can play in different formations and different systems. They watch the game, but they're also so fast, so strong, uh, and they can execute a skill quicker than other people. And that's ultimately kind of what it comes down to. And, you know, when we're, when we're looking at players, it's really like, who's impacting the game? Um, because you can see 10,000 soccer players that all have a great first touch. Okay, but what are you doing with your first touch that's winning winning or losing a game? And our again, like our jobs as college coaches depend on wins and losses, unfortunately. But like it can't all be about player development. Obviously, we want to make our players better, but we also need players that want to come in that want to compete and want to win. And it can't just be, let me go go through the motions. And so something that I always ask club coaches when I am uh, have identified a player I'll call a club coach and I say, what's her training habits? What is she like in practice? Because that's going to matter once they get here, right? Are you only good in games? Um, I want to know, do you keep score when you do possession exercises? Um, you know, when you're doing fitness with your club team, does she come in first or does she die trying to come in first? Or is she like happy being middle of the pack? Those little details translate to the college game in a big way because it is a, it's a full-time job to play college soccer and you have to really love it and you have to be really, really passionate about it and really committed. So it's not just about kind of going out and performing, you know, on the field and not, you know, on the, on the weekends, right? It's about what's your mentality like Monday through Friday also. Uh, so there's a lot of different things, but ultimately I just, I want someone that's, that's committed, um, that loves the grind uh, and that values, you know, performance improvement that always wants to get better. It's great how you say love the grind. What, what is it that, because I know for some of the listeners that are listening, um, it's easier saying the grind. If you can explain to our players that are in high school that are younger and in club, they feel they know what they're doing when they're grinding. Mm -hmm. To us, like, this is grind. This is difficult. If you can explain to us a day-to-day -day, um, at UC Davis what a hard grind is like to kind of kind of break down of, you know, this is a regiment at a Division One program mm -hmm. that, you know, and some players I know personally, and the reason I'm trying to say this is I know players that are talented, that are running circles, everything. But the reason they can't make it into, let's say, from Division One to Pro or at a Pro in MLS to Europe is the day in, day out grind. It's like, man, I just, my butt, I can't do this mentally, mm -hmm. emotionally, physically, seven days a week, six days. It's just the, the tempo is too high, the, the fitness, the demand, every league is different. I want to kind of break down when we say love to grind. What is a typical day grind at UC Davis? 
Oh, well, I, I think it depends at where we're at in terms of like our tactical periodization or where we're at in our season. So, um, you know, being in season versus being in your winter, you know, kind of winter off season or your spring kind of prep for the fall. So it kind of depends, but, um, you know, if we're, if we're really in season or we're kind of leading up in that spring season up to, you know, our, our fall competition, um, we're training five days a week. Um, you get typically one game or one day off, um, we're required to give you one day off. So you have to, again, like really show up and compete. Um, uh, I think that there's programs that like to stat practices. And I know that stats aren't necessarily something that you think of with soccer. You think it's like a football or like a basketball, um, kind of, you know, tool, but something, for example, that we stat at UC Davis is we stat like hustle points and grind points. Um, and so what that means is after you lose the ball, do you try to win it back in two seconds or less, or do you have that let down? Um, cause to me, there's a difference between if you're tracking or you're statting, did you, you know, win a, win an air ball off a of clearance there's, you could win an air ball off a of clearance, um, with nobody around you. Right. Or did you win it with traffic? Were there four or five people that you're having to battle off, right? And they're both considered clearances, but they're very different, right? One has like a grind element to it. One has like, I had to fight to, you know, for positioning and knock off a couple players off balance and still get up and find the ball, right? Versus no pressure on the ball. It's, it's the same thing, but it's not. And so those are little things uh, when I think about the grind, like you have to love that kind of stuff. Like you have to love that element of like, I'm doing more than what the minimum is. And so when you're in the fall season, typically, you know, you're training five days a week or you're training four days a week with two games and one day off. Um, you're watching film, uh, probably for two or three hours a week, uh, individual with your coach based on your performance. Then you're watching it as a team together based on the team performance. You're probably lifting two or three days a week for another, you know, hour, hour and a half, um, and then typically we do individual skill sets or units, unit based training, um, an hour, you know, before practice or after practice. So, you know, you're really committing, I'd say about 20 to 25 hours a week, um, of just pure soccer related activities. And if you look at what's the time frame that you're spending with your club team, let's say you train four days a week for two hours, that's only eight hours. So you're like, oh my gosh, wait, now I have to add 12 more hours somehow into my week. That's what college soccer is. Like, that's why I said, like, you have to love it. You have to love the grind. Cause then on top of that, after you're done with soccer, now you're going to class for three or four hours, right. And you're studying and, you know, you're taking tests and you're writing papers and you're reading books. And then you also want your college life and you need to go make friends and have a social life and, um, you know, join clubs and get internships and network for your job and your career. So there's, it's, it's a full, full-time job um, being a student athlete. So there's a lot of players that think that they love the game and then they come to college soccer and they're like, wait, I don't just get to like show up and play and then leave and I'm done. It is, you are committed all the time. Cause you have to think about, I need to sleep for eight hours to make sure that I'm hundred percent prep for tomorrow's practice. Because if I only sleep six, I'm not going to perform well, which means I might lose my starting spot, which means I might lose my travel spot because there's someone always that's going to work harder than you. Right. And you have to constantly outwork yourself. So it's, am I eating properly? Am I, you know, am I drinking enough water? Cause everything that you're doing is about not preparing for games. You're preparing for training. And I think that sometimes there's this thought of, um, you know, oh, well, when it's game time, I'm going to show up. I'm really going to perform well. It's like, you don't, you're not all of a sudden like magically better on game day, guys. Like that's like not how this works, right? You're going to look exactly how you train. You don't just show up and you're better on, on the day for your game. Like you have to put it in every single day. So you do have to love the grind because it's a lot of, it's a big time commitment. It's a, like you said, like the mentality is such a huge component to it. Um, it's almost more important, honestly, than like the physical component in a lot of ways, because you really do have to love it and you have to, you have to want to see it through and you have to love being there. No, I mean, exactly all the stuff we wanted to, to kind of touch on to kind of um, get in there. It's the student athlete too is different than the professional athlete. And I think that's a different grind. People don't realize that 
you're going in the classroom trying to have the same mindset you have on the pitch and you have to perform on both to be eligible to play. And, you know, like you said, having your eight hours sleep and obviously you want to have the social life, but who are your friends? If they're not on the team, then they're going to eat certain things that they can eat, but obviously you can't because you got to have your body as a temple to go there, perform to maximum, especially in today's game. I think, and obviously the reason is we're evolving within the game as a society. There's more technology. There's more knowledge that back then it wasn't even as strict. Now every data is being broken down. So even the nutrition is even more strict. I, I mean, I remember when we would check into our, um, professional team in Iran, we would get five five thousand dollar fine if we uh went below six percent body fat. Mm -hmm. And by by doing that, that that cause of you know you're in a structure. That's why when I was saying mentality is you, for some that love their cheat days, their foods and everything, we all love it at times. You're like, you know what? I think I did what I wanted to accomplish. I got to move on. And mm -hmm. that word that you just said love the grind those are the moments that it's going to really show the student athlete. How much do you love it? Mm -hmm. How much do you love the program? And I think it's key into whenever these student athletes come to your campus on a tour and they, uh, they just don't try to be pleasing you, but obviously trying to understand the campus, the field, is this something they want to be on as well? I want to kind of go into that. How is that important when, you know, so many times when players reach out, they want to show that they belong in your program. Mm -hmm. But as coaches, it's like, we got to sometimes we flip it. We're like, is this a program do you want to belong in? Yes. You know, because you come in, it's funny, they're so excited freshman year. Mm -hmm. And then by the end of freshman, man, you see the, you see the transition of mindset. We've seen it so many times. I want to kind of break in, break that down. How vital is that? And if if you kind of put yourself in their shoes, what are the qualities that you try to uh, look for? And the questions you try to ask the coaches to kind of check off if this is the ultimate fit for you. Mm -hmm. Well, this is, you know, something I think that it is really, really important because there's so many schools, like there's so many different programs. And when you try to make some for something to fit and it doesn't, it you can't hide in, in college, right? Like, and that's what, you know, it's scary about early commitment because you might sign up for something that you don't actually want that your parents want, but they're not the ones that are going to school and they're not the ones playing in the program. Um, you know, and so you really do want to do your due diligence and do some research. And I think that that's a great question to ask college coaches or what are your values? Um, you know, and sometimes they're going to have really generic answers or they might not have a value system in place. Um, but ultimately, like no one's going to enjoy their experience if you're the coach or the player, if your values aren't aligned, right? And you're not after the same thing. You don't have the same goals and standards, um, you know? And so for me, when I'm, when I'm talking to players, um, like one of my values is resilience, right? And to me, resilience is the ability to never give up. So when I talk to coaches about, you know, a club player, again, like, how does she handle adversity? What does she do when she makes a mistake? Does she give up? And to me, that's a huge indicator. Uh, she probably just isn't going to enjoy it because that's a value of mine as a head coach. And guess who makes the decisions? Guess who makes the lineups? It's me. So if you don't fit in my value system, then this isn't going to be the right spot for you. So don't try to make it happen, you know? And what's interesting about values is they're, they're trainable, right? You don't wake up a resilient infant, right? Like there's something that's trained. There's things that happen when you come into a program, you're not all of a sudden going to like fit every single, you know, value that they have. Um, but do you have potential to be accepting of some of those values? So, you know, another value that we have is, um, performance improvement and, that to me is we're not always going to focus on wins and losses and like the outcome, but like, did we get better on the day? Did we get better at training? There's just all, we're always looking, you know, for performing performance improvement. And so like we value getting better, we value improvement here. And 
you know, players that are maybe super focused on wins and losses, which again, one of our other values is competition and being able to compete. So, you know, there's a balance, but, um, you know, players that don't focus on individual development or player development or their, you know, personal development, then like, again, it's not going to fit here. If I ask you to come out at, you know, 8 a.m. to do an extra hour of shooting and you come in and you kind of half-ass it or you're not super invested, well, you're not following my value, right? Like you, you're not valuing your performance improvement, which again, you don't get to be here. Like, sorry, if everybody else is in the same value system and and you decided that this one isn't for you, well, you don't get to be here then. So to me, when you're going through the recruiting process, you have to talk to their coaches about, you know, what am I getting into? Is this going to be the right spot? Because everybody's going to have a different way of executing their values also. You know, for me, I use my value system to make decisions. That's, that's what I can always reflect back on. Are we always doing things in the best interest of the team? And I use the value system that we've created to, you know, kind of help make those decisions. And so, you know, when you're looking at the levels, um, you know, division one, division two, II, division three, NAIA, there might be a different value system at each level. There might all be the same, but it's, you know, how are the coaches executing it? Are the players actually bought in or are these just like fun words thrown out, you know, that we like hope our players buy into Like, does the coach, you know, actually follow the value system or are they telling you to do something and they're doing something completely different. Um, but that, that's a huge piece for sure is, is asking those questions um, and then identifying, you know, again, are, are they words or is there, is there validity and like, truth and follow through to what it is that you want out of your experience. And are they, are they going to give you the experience that you actually want? Or are they just trying to get you to come to the school so that their opponent doesn't get you also, you know? No, I mean, that's exactly how I think the world of coaching works, especially today where um, the coaching world is so advanced now. It's so meticulous now. It's so attention to detail where a lot of coaches, they try to say less and manipulate environment to expose what their values are, meaning that you, you'll try to create environments to challenge your players and identify who has those values, especially if maybe you didn't recruit the class, you inherited a program and you're going in and you have set values that you're like, if I'm going to battle with this group of players and the thing, and we're in the trenches and everything's going wrong, what is the response? Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes as much as we say we have the talent, we have the the grit, we have the thing, but the the hostility is not a t- culture. There's no team vibe. There's no team environment where they're trying to help each other. There's no chemistry. And I think mm-hmm. chemistry and caring, for, especially on, the, I think, um, on the male traits is different. Female traits is mm-hmm. different. There's got to be different ways of communication. I think um, everybody has those different traits. And um, when it's not clicking internally, Mm -hmm. it's hard to show it because we're like, man, what's going on? He's he's so talented. She's so talented. This is unacceptable. But because maybe she just doesn't like to play next to that person. I don't Mm -hmm. like, coach, I don't like the system you set up. I just don't. And the whole time it's eating in their head. And you're like, my goodness. They're not going to, I can't pl- have a player like that. So those are so vital. My thing that I want to kind of get into is as you're kind of incorporating, um, let's say your recruiting class and the values that you kind of looked into, how vital does your system of play, style of play, let's say you have a set of style of play and a system, mm-hmm. how important role does that play in when you are recruiting? let's say your type of play, we discussed the values, Mm -hmm. but I want to kind of transition more into um, talent base, athletically, Mm -hmm. physically, technically. Uh, What is it for your kind of program um, that they got to kind of fit into that style of play? Mm -hmm. I think that it varies and it's different um, depending on 
how established you are at your program. So for me, you know, at UC Davis right now, we've only, I've only had one season um, and I've kind of inherited some players. I brought in some players um, where we're still building where I wouldn't say that, you know, right now my, <laughs> my system of play is winning games. And so I don't, I'm going to change formations a hundred times to get the best players on the field. That's going to showcase and highlight their strengths to win games. Um, you know, in fast forward five years, when I have, you know, more of a, an established kind of style of play and the, typically the players that I like, um, are all here, you know, then we'll have more of a a specific system. Um, you know, but my, my fourth year at San Francisco state, um, when I was recruiting, that's the, you know, I kind of had finally at my fourth season, my, I don't want to say like my players, but I had gotten a lot of players that, kind of fit a type, um, into the way that I like to play. And I like to play, you know, very, like very fit players that we can play high pressure. Um, you know, not necessarily based on counterattack, but, you know, just this like ultra competitive, um, kind of gritty feisty team, um, that, you know, can I just really good decision makers. So do we want to, you know, build out of the back and possess, or can we identify a time to counter and, So really, really tactically aware players, um, but also can execute things very athletically. So technique to me is important. um, And obviously you want complete players, but I really like, you know, competitive mentality players that are also really athletic, you know, that can get up the field quickly, cover a lot of space. Because for me, I'd say like my strength as a coach is defending and set pieces. And so those two qualities, I really, really like, those are really important things. Um, but right now when we're recruiting and we're looking, it's like you're the, and this isn't specific to UC Davis. Um, this is what, you know, was everywhere is you're always trying to out recruit yourself. Right. So you're looking, you might need to fill a a position, right? Maybe your nines graduating, maybe your center backs are graduating. So you kind of obviously have to look specifically for those players, but ultimately you're just trying to find someone better than what you have now. And so if you have a, you know, a pretty good, you know, winger, but you identify and you don't really need a winger because maybe you've got five wingers on your roster already, but you see a winger that, you know, is a junior senior in high school, you're like, well, she's better than we have now. So why would I, why would I not recruit her? Even though we don't necessarily need another player, you're always looking right to find something better than what you have, which goes back to if you are already at an institution and you're already in that program, you better like the grind because there is someone three years younger than you or two years younger than that, that you don't know even exists. That's trying to get your spot. And the coach is looking to fill that spot. If you're not doing, you know, your best and you're not training, well, great. I'm going to have a freshman start over a senior then, you know, like that's just the nature of it. And so I think most coaches don't necessarily recruit to a system. They do just try to find the best player for their program. Um, it's funny, like really early on in my coaching career, I I asked, you know, a coach that had been coaching for like 25 years. I said, do you recruit to a system or do you just recruit the best players? Or how do you, how do you build a formation? Um, you know, is it because you love the four, three, three, and that's all, you know, how to coach. So you always play four, three, three, or, you know, what do you do? Um, and they said, you want to make your best players shine. So you build a system around your best players and whatever is going to showcase their talents and their strengths that's what formation you play. So if you have three killer attacking mids, you know, all right, maybe you play a four, two, three, one, you know, maybe you change up your system just based on what your, you know, best player, two killer, great outside backs that crush. All right. You know, maybe you play a four, four, two with a diamond that allows them to have overloads in the wide area, you know, whatever it is that you want to do. Um, but I, I would say that most coaches probably recruit to, out recruit themselves. So something better than they have, um, you know, unless you're at a program like Stanford that, you know, doesn't have any holes and <laughs> they're just always looking, you know, for, they could play any system anytime, um, and still, still do really well. So, uh, it, that's why it's important to like show versatility too, as a recruit is, you know, what you might play as a center mid on your, um, you know, your high school team, your club team, a college coach might watch you play and be like, oh, she'd be a great outside back because she's better. Her skill set as a center mid might suit her better on my college team as an outside back. So showing your versatility and, you know, being open to change and is really important also. 
No, I mean, it's it's huge. And I, and I love how we touch on athleticism. I get it. The game is football. And I'm a, I'm actually a technical guy. I love the technical game. I think um, if you're smart enough, obviously, if you're not athletic, you've got to be really smart, really technical. But if you are, you can get around that athletic person like no other, if, if you are. Mm -hmm. But an example, the U.S. versus France, I thought France was a more technical team in that World mm -hmm. Cup, um, very technical, but U.S. won. Why? More athletic. U.S. is known for developing athletes just because the access to female athletes get to sports performance and the facilities to get become better athletes. It's mm -hmm. higher than any country, right. hands down hands down. And because of that, it was a true representation of winning. And I think at the level you are at, and at that certain level above it, it's winning. It's winning. You have to win to keep your job. And I believe they asked some coaches that, what is your system of play? What is your style of play? Winning, winning, it's winning. So whatever gets the job done. Mm -hmm. So what, what he broke down basically was, it depends on what type of players I have. I have to build the best to get the best players on the field. So if I don't have the best back line, I'm only going to play with three yep. and <laughs> strongest midfield on that field. And we make it work and we dominate it because the best players got to be there. So every class, like you said, is different. You might have a different class that as much as you recruit, you just that year, you didn't have the amount of defenders you liked to fit your program. So you had to overload on midfielders and people, some, a lot of the play, uh, audience that are parents that, that are not in the sport of, let's say soccer football, mm -hmm. it's a different game. It's, mm -hmm. it's 11 versus 11 It's different than other sports. So uh, it's, that's why sometimes when they don't want you as much as the name, UC Davis, UCLA, UNC, mm -hmm. you're like, I have my eye only on UNC. I need to be a Tar Heel. I'm going right. to make it at a Tar Heel. And I want to kind of transition into that because we, we've all been in those shoes where we're balling out and we have our top three. And if we're really good, we're also special. We want to go Stanford. Let's just say right now, Stanford, UNC, the big names athletic, athletically, um, you know, UCLA. I'll even throw Berkeley in there. <laughs> uh, but um, they're, they grab the eye mm -hmm. and – and the thing is, as the program for athletic programs, they're up there. But sometimes we overlook who's the coach there? Who's the players there? Mm -hmm. Maybe they have four players in your position without you knowing it. Yep. And, and in the end of the day, maybe the coach doesn't like your style. And you go there and you're like, are you forced to become your number 10? And you mm -hmm. can number 10. That coach sees you as a right back. Right. That coach sees you as a center back. And he sees you as a backup right back. And we, you go in there and you quit after your four years. You got your education, but was that what you really wanted? To get your education from UNC, you got a degree. Wow, you're in the program. Got maybe throughout the whole four years, let's say 200 minutes in, if that. And it was one of those things that you reflect back. You're like, uh, soccer was, yeah, but you know what it is. But if you've gone to maybe a smaller division one mm -hmm. and you pushed it, you could have maybe had a longer career. You ended up loving it more and more. The coach even injected more belief in you. Mm -hmm. If we looked at it, I want to go into that for players that have their eyes set on, let's say those top five, especially on the women's side, we mm -hmm. know the, the top five, they have it set on yeah. that. It shouldn't only be that. And what should you do if as much as you're knocking at that door, they're not opening the door. <laughs> okay. And sure. you know, when should you say, you know what, I should talk to other coaches. Um, what else should they look for? If you're kind of maybe a parent for them or you're a player in their shoes. Yeah. There's, there's a couple of things uh, to think about. And my, my advice is always to, if you're interested in a school that is a big time school, okay. Big time soccer program is look at their roster and identify who are the, what are the types of players that they're getting? So if you go down Stanford's roster, for example, and I, you know, and there's a lot of other schools that you could compare Stanford to and, you know, their entire roster has youth national team experience, but you don't, 
Well, that might be an indicator that you're not quite at that level. And that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. But like, you've got to like, look at the tip, look at the players that they are already there, you know, and that, that should be, and you know, and I know there's players that like have this self-belief and like, well, I'm better than so-and-so. And this is another thing that parents don't think about is that there's a, there's a kind of a pretty wide variety of why players might end up at different schools. So I know that there's, it can get really frustrating, right? Cause if you're a center mid and a girl on your club team is also center mid, but you know that you're better and somehow she's committed to UCLA and you're not, she might have set up something with the coach where she's just, she's walking on, she's not getting a scholarship. Maybe, um, you know, she has had a different discussion with the coach about what her role is going to be. And she's okay. Never playing a minute. I mean, and these are real, these are real conversations that happen, you know? And so I I always think like when you're looking at trying to figure out where you want to go to school, like think about it from your perspective, do not compare where other people are going that, you know, because you have no idea why they are going to an institution or why they're going to a program. You cannot compare, like it's completely irrelevant. Um, you know, cause I, I've, I've heard having coach club, like, well, I'm better than that girl. I can't believe that she's going there. Well, you don't know why she's going there. You know, there's a variety of different reasons that players end up at different places. You know, uh, maybe they had an agreement that she wasn't going to get a scholarship for three years and her senior year, she will. But you know, like if that's the approach that, you know, someone told one other player that might work for them, but somebody else, they might say, I don't want to do that. So like you said, you know, it's. It, there's again, there, there's so many options and opportunities to play college soccer that, you know, I would say if you're looking at like a top 25 school and you've been reaching out to them and they haven't reached out to you, most of those programs know who they want. They get blue chip players. They get players that everybody else wants that they've been on the list for a very long time. Um, and that's just the nature of it, right? Is like they identify the best players. And so if they're, you know, I don't really know why you would want to go to a school that isn't recruiting you because especially at that level, like if you're looking at the top 15 to top 25 schools, like they're, they're recruiting people, right? You're not recruiting them. That's not really how that works. Now, 25 to 300, kind of a different boat, right? They just might not have had the option, your opportunity to see you. So continually, you know, reach out, be consistent and, um, you know, reach out, but, you know, again, ask the question of how many, you know, do I want to be one of 30? Do I want to be, you know, the 15th player in one class? Um, you know, is it, do I want to ride the bench for four years or do I want to give myself, like you said, an option to play and you have to figure out what's important to you. And I think unfortunately in high school and with the pressure of parents and, and to be honest, a lot of clubs, the clubs want their players to go to the highest level just so that they can brag about it or put it on their website so that they get other younger club players to play for them, you know, but they're ultimately setting up their kids and their players for, for failure because they're trying to convince a college coach that this player should go there when they really have no business there. So now you've got a kid that's unhappy, that's playing at a college who's sitting on the bench who never should have been there in the first place. Nobody wins in that situation, right? Now they transfer, they're unhappy, they quit. Like that, you got to find the right fit and the right balance. And just because you want to be able to go to the grocery store as a mom and be like, oh, my daughter's going to UCLA, you know, but my, she's miserable, you know, and never playing one minute, like you're not going to school there. Like find the best fit and the best level for your player. And that's, you know, that's for club coaches too. Is I have a lot of, you know, coaches that reach out, oh, I've got a player, should be great for you. I'm like, cool. When's the last time you saw us play a game? Oh, I never mm-hmm. have. Oh, well then how do you know she'd be good for me? Like, what does that even mean? You know, oh no, she's, she's got it really, she plays a really, really good level. And, you know, like, I'm like, you've never seen us play. So I don't know what you're talking about. Have you ever watched a big West game? Have you ever watched a PAC 12 game? You know? So one of the things that I always ask, and this is for parents and players is when someone, a club coach or a player, you know, calls me about someone, um, you know, cause there's, there's obviously different levels like, you know, Stanford, Cal, UCLA, USC, big time programs. So if they're like, oh, she'd be great for Davis. Okay. Well, why wouldn't she be good for Stanford is something I'll ask back. You know, why wouldn't she be good for UCLA? Um, and 
I try to get the the coaches to think about, you know, what the deficiencies are. So there's just a little bit more honesty about the level and, you know, most of the time the feedback is like, well, and this is why I say it. I know you and I talked about it is, well, she's just not as athletic. And I'm like, there it is. Thank you. Like they're all really, really great soccer players, but there is a different type of level of athlete that gets to play at those programs. And that's really the biggest difference maker. Um, so that's typically what I ask is, well, why here and why not there? No, and that's big. And you yourself playing at Cal uh, at a Pac-12 at the time. It wasn't a Pac-12, I think. Pac-10. <laughs> Pac-10. Um, it's, it's different levels to it. Mm-hmm. And in, I think a checkpoint to kind of get those kind of programs attention, even a UC Davis attention, mm-hmm. I think you will give that player an attention if they have a U16 U.S. Youth National Team cap. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, that's that's the stepping stone. And I think if a player is at 14, 13, and they want to go to those kind of programs, that should be the first checking point. Okay, let's see if you can make a national team invite. Can mm-hmm. you make that? How do you get on their radar? Instead of trying to say, I want to map my way to UC Davis, Cal Berkeley, UCLA, Stanford, UNC, the first stepping stone that gets your their attention because those are the ones that they don't, you don't go reaching to them to be in the playing program. They come and look at those top mm-hmm. echelon because they have, they have that luxury. Right. So, <laughs> so the, the, the thing is, let's say you're advising your own kid, family member, or even yourself at the time. How is someone going to get an attention if they're good enough? What are the platforms to get U.S. Youth National Team Scouts attention to get into those training camps? What is the, those processes if um, if we can go into that? Yeah, I, I mean, your your club coach is your best friend in that way. Um, they're the one that's going to call and, and reach out or the director of coaching is going to get you on the radar for the youth national team system. Obviously, there's like PDP and ODP and different kind of pathways. And the best thing about those is really just extra training. Um You know, obviously there's kind of a a built-in pathway. You make the state team and the regional team and things like that. But ultimately, you're really just putting yourself in an environment where you're competing at a higher level and you're around better players. Um, So you're getting better training um, and more consistent training uh, that hopefully will make you a better player that, you know, gives more incentive for your club coach or your DOC to call, you know, a scout to come watch you play. Um, but, you know, unfortunately, there, there really isn't just a A plus B equals C, right? There's not like, a, I want to play on the national team, so I'm going to do these three things, and then I'm going to get there. Um, it's a really, really interesting, you know, kind of pathway for everybody. And everybody's unique. Everyone's different, especially because you develop at different times. Um, you know, there's players that are, like, when you're little, right? So if you're looking at, like, U14, U15, sometimes, like, the best players that stand out are you know, the ones that are like the biggest, best athletes, because it's just so easy for them to, you know, manipulate space and exploit speed and and mismatches, you know, in the flank or whatever. But then, you know, fast forward to U17, U18, well, now everyone's fast, everyone's strong, right? So now that you didn't work on some of those other skills, um, you know, like your first touch, receiving balls out of the air, playing with your back to goal, like the, the really kind of finite parts of the game, well, now you're going to get surpassed, right? And on the flip side of that, maybe your skill when you're U14 is you're super, super technical and you've got great vision and you know you can solve problems with your feet. But then fast forward, you know, three or four years now you're U18 and because you're playing against better athletes, some of that skill doesn't work as well. Or you struggle to get on the ball and hold it because someone outweighs you by 30 pounds. You know, so there's there's little things. And so that's why it's important to really focus on like the holistic development of your game and not just one particular area so that as players get older and they mature and they, they develop, you know, you're not losing ground in any area of the game in particular um, because you do, you do, you know, develop at different times. And there's players that I've seen, you know, that were 14 that I was like, ah, she's all right. And then at 17, I'm like, Oh, damn, like she's, she's gotten a lot better. She's improved. So I don't think that anyone's ever going to really write off a player entirely 
um, unless they aren't improving um, and you know it, or, you know, it's just not the right fit for you. And it's not necessarily what you're looking for in your program. No, I mean, that's huge. And the main thing, um, as we're kind of wrapping up and from this uh, discussion that I'm gaining is there is no set way. There is no set pathway. And I think we need to be open. If you really love the game, you're going to do it, not mattering where you play at, where Mm -hmm. you do it. You just want to play and you want to show um, how good you are. And you're not thinking about 10 years from now, five years, you're thinking about the moment. Mm -hmm. And for me, it's funny when I was, um, when I was younger, there was two athletes for me. I, I come from a household of non-athletes. Everybody's a doctor, lawyer, education. They always told me to quit. It's a hobby. Mm-hmm. Don't ever do this. Go into academics. What are you going to do from playing? So it was very difficult to pass, uh, make my own pathway mm-hmm. and not knowing the end of the tunnel. So I would always find ways to watch these two athletes, two clips. And the two were Michael Jordan and Tom Brady. And the reason I really drew to them because they got a lot of setbacks. They were cut over and over. And I, and I know there's people that don't like both of them. It's a love hate with some, and I know majority love Michael Jordan, but Tom mm-hmm. Brady, you it's some people respect him, but it's not that uh, love for him as a character. But for me, it, it always shows that it doesn't matter where you're going. If mm-hmm. you really love the game, as much as you get setbacks, it's not going to stop you from playing. And this, it, I think that should go in the same thing in the recruiting process. I think in today's um, today's world, a lot of the parents are taking the lead in these where mm-hmm. it should be the pure athlete. My main thing is, let's just stop it there. Ask you, where do you want to go? What's mm-hmm. the main qualities you like? Well, I just want to play. You want to play? Does it matter? what? No, I want to play. I, and that's the main thing. A lot of those great athletes, they wanted to play. And anywhere they played, they just wanted to show I'm the best one on the field. Yeah. And when they did that, it brought the other attentions that it deserved. If you're meant to be a superstar, you're going to be a superstar. Mm -hmm. If you're meant to be a professional, you're going to be a professional. Yeah. You're meant to be a division one. You're going to be a division one. That's the simple truth. And people (laughs) say, no, we got to make it happen. No, if you are hardworking enough and you have the potential, some people work hard and they have no potential. Right. That's not their fault. But if you have the potential, you're going to get there. And that's the that's the kind of perspective I want the audience to kind of gain from all of this stuff we were discussing, because there's so many times that the parents are like, no, we can make these happen. Yeah, you can. And she can still play D1, but it can be somewhere else where yeah. it can kind of maximize that. I, I agree. That's always a tough conversation is. You know, because obviously like UC Davis, it's a fantastic academic school, you know, and, you know, some of our, obviously our biggest competitors in terms of like recruiting and experiences, you know, Cal and obviously another UC not too far away and my alma mater and things like that. But I'm like, listen, you can be a walk on at Cal or you could be a scholarship athlete here, you know, so is the financial piece important to you? You're getting more or less the same academic experience. Okay. You might be a 10 minute player there, but you might be a 70 minute player here what do you want? You know, like you might, it'd be really hard to be a big 12 champion or sorry, pack 12 champion. Look at the conference here. There's a different than the big West. There's a different conference champion every year. So it's in the wheelhouse. Like this is something that we can build and do together, you know? And it's like, then you skip parents. Yeah, but it's Cal. I'm like, I, I love Cal more than anybody probably, you know? And so I'm like, I, again, like this is your experience. You choose it. What do you want out of your experience? What do you want, you know, to achieve? Um, what do you want to look back on after four years of your experience in the program? Like, what do you want to stick out? Is it playing time? Is it winning? Is it friendships? Is it, you know, the career that you're going to get post-graduation make a list? Like how does it, how, what does that look like for you? And I always tell the player, I'm like, mom and dad aren't coming to college with you. So do you actually want to be here or not? (laughs) What do you want? Cause ultimately they're not going to matter, you know, once, once you show up. So you decide. I totally agree. And I, it's, it's the firm believer of anything you do in life. I think when, <laughs> if you don't chase it and you just 
stay where you are and work hard, mm -hmm. obviously have purpose and intentions of stuff you want to achieve. But if you do what you love and you pursue it with passion every day, you're going to start to draw people around you with that same love and step by step start to steer you in that direction that you were meant to go. Right. Everybody has that path. But if you want to say, you know what? No, I want to go Tracy Ham's path. I want to go Cal Berkeley, then go coach at San Francisco University. Mm -hmm. I want to go then to UC Davis. That's Tracy Ham's path. You have to have your path. You know, everybody has to have their unique path with it. And people like, and that's what it's unique. There's nothing wrong with it. But because mm -hmm. the media, the marketing <laughs> aspects, it's like, it's UCLA, it's Stanford. And I think when we layer it, take a layer away from this is every university, and like you said, there's so many options, D1, D2, mm -hmm. D3. They all have a value for what you want to gain from it. And there is no end path. It's just you got to deep down if you know where you want to go. And I think if you put that fishnet, like you said, out there and see if you what your hard work, what it gets you, mm -hmm. um, I think that's worthwhile. Yeah. Keep an open mind. Cast a wide net. Um, sometimes, you know, and I, I always just recommend take as many visits as you can. Um, to different schools. You don't necessarily do like a bajillion ID camps, but take as many visits because once you're there, you're going to find that there's more places that don't fit than do fit. Um, so that that's my biggest piece of advice is go visit campus. I don't, this isn't really what I'm looking for. There's never going to be one school that's going to check every box, right? But at least you can, the more perspective that you have by visiting, you know, the more places, um, then, you know, the better decision you're going to make. And like, you can, you can start to maybe write off some different schools or, or areas or locations or levels, um, you know, just based on your experience visiting places. For sure. For sure. Again, Tracy, thank you so much for making it, uh, making the time and your busy schedule. And I know at this time, as you're preparing for spring um, and getting ready to kind of hopefully uh, fingers crossed having a having a season this year <laughs> yeah uh, we don't know it's so it's so unprecedented um we, who would have thought from our last conversation it's still continuing to go the way it is but it is a serious matter i mean it, it is i mean player safety human safety everything's uh, vital and i think um if we can take from it um the lot of stuff we gained is a lot of self-reflection as human beings and things that we all have to do to still improve and um, reflect on to make um, our lifestyles better in this um, in this world, in this planet. And it makes everything better. Um, I want to give the floor to you to close this out with any any new projects. I know you I know you had a couple last time. Any new projects that you're working on that our audience should know about to, that's gonna they can get involved in to better enhance the game. Um, it would be huge. And then from there we'll go on our way. All right. Uh, yes, we just launched in December. So fairly new, the uh, Women in Soccer Organization and Network. Mm. Um, that's basically, it, it's for any woman or male ally that uh, just is passionate about the game. You don't need to be a player or a coach. You can be a parent. You can be just a fan. Um, but it's a, it's a network that basically allows you to connect with other people in your area, ask questions. So recruiting questions, you can connect to a coach. Um, think like LinkedIn for soccer is kind of what it, what it feels like a little bit, but there's some really, really cool programming that they have. Um, Brandy Chastain does a weekly, uh, Q and a, like this week she did one with Crystal Dunn. Um, so Brandy's on the board and she's heavily involved. Uh, there's a podcast that Carrie Taylor does. Uh, I believe she does it twice a month. Um, and there's just different like networking and summits and, and a whole bunch of different cool stuff. So I definitely recommend checking womeninsoccer.org out, um, or following it on social media because they give you all the details for all the cool stuff. So that's it. That's all I got. For sure. Thank you so much again. Mm -hmm. No problem. Thank you. 